You're now listening to part eight of our 12-part series, A Healthy Heart, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Time Monk Radio. Hi, Gemini. It's wonderful to be with you again. How did you do on last week's assignment? Were you able to eat leafy greens every day? We eat leafy greens every day, and we've been doing that for years and years. Love them. It is just, you know, once you get over that little hump of going, leafy greens every day, what? And then it becomes part of your diet. It's like you look at a plate of food and there's no leafy greens on it and you go, something's missing. Yes, and we crave crave them. And there's so many of them. Yes. (laughs) Just so many choices. Now, some of those leafy greens that I mentioned, beet greens, Swiss chard, and lamb's quarter are actually quite high in oxalic acid. And oxalic acid doesn't like to be oxalic acid. It prefers to be calcium oxalate. So when we eat those greens, although greens are thought of as a good source of calcium, those particular greens not only don't supply calcium, they tend to actually leach calcium from the body. And there's a couple of ways around that. First of all, we think about cultures that use those greens, and you will um, perhaps immediately get a picture of, say, spanakopita, which is greens baked with cheese. In Germany, wonderful farm I was visiting, and they went out to the garden and picked a bunch of chard. We call it um, Swiss chard here, and actually they call it silver beet there. Chopped it up, and I thought she was going to put it in a pan with some water and cook it like I would, but instead she put it in a pan with milk and cooked it and said, this is the best way to see to it that you get the good nutrition from this plant. So greens, 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 greens. We hope you listeners are also eating your greens as well. And here we are at week eight of our series, Joy in Your Heart. We've talked a little bit about grief and about anxiety and about inflammation and how these things affect the heart and what we can do. And now let's talk about joy in the heart. Let's talk about hormones. Hormones are messengers. They circulate in the blood, and they give the body a rapid way to respond to changing circumstances, especially threats. The hormonal, nervous, immune, and cardiovascular systems are intertwined and speak to each other by means of hormones. Hormones influence every aspect of our health and well-being, including the heart and blood vessels. Hormones are made by the endocrine glands, such as the thyroid, the testes, the ovaries, and the adrenals. And hormones are also made in the brain by the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the pineal. Every fat cell in your body can make hormones, as can your small intestines, your kidneys, and, if you're pregnant, the placenta. In all likelihood, I believe that we are going to discover eventually that the heart itself makes hormones as well as responding to their messages. Hormones may be thought of as specialized kinds of fats. They are indeed fatty substances, and the fats that we consume can have a powerful influence on our hormones. Hormone-like substances found in plants such as phytosterols, saponins, phytoestrogens, and lignans promote heart health. On the other hand, stress hormones such as cortisol, adrenaline, and noradrenaline are associated with heart attacks. Stress hormones increase the heart rate, raise the blood pressure, shut down key metabolic processes, and interfere with the oxygenation of every cell in the body. That's fine, short term. If you need to run away from or face a danger, those are good things to have happening in your body. But that's not fine if it goes on long term. 
Stress hormones are strongly linked with cardiovascular disease and increased overall risk of death. We are eroded from the inside out when stress hormones are constant residents instead of occasional visitors. People with the highest levels of cortisol in their urine or their hair compared to those with the lowest levels, five times as likely to die of a heart attack or a stroke. And this association holds true whether there is active heart disease or not. Remember where we started in saying that last week that 50% of the people who have heart attacks don't have classical symptoms for them. This is hopefully going to become somewhat more uh, something that we are going to look for, but cortisol cannot really be measured from a blood draw. That's why these tests use the amount of cortisol in the urine or their hair, and well, it can be measured in a blood draw. It's so inaccurate that it's considered not worth doing. And the urine tests and the hair tests are... M- not normal, regular things that you can get. And should you be able to get them, they are incredibly expensive. So at this point, there are some serious hurdles to go through for us to use these levels as a diagnostic to help point people in the way of what they need to do to help their heart. But this will change, and it will probably change within the next five years or so. In fact, hair cortisol levels are a stronger predictor of heart attack risk than cholesterol levels or blood pressure, high levels, high blood pressure. The cortisol level in hair is a more correct way to look at who is going to have a heart attack than by measuring cholesterol or blood pressure. I feel that I need to say this several times because it's not what we assume. We go to the doctor and the doctor says, we're going to check your blood pressure. We're going to measure your cholesterol. We think, hey, that's great. We're going to see if I'm at risk. If my cholesterol is up, we're going to get it down. We're going to get down my risk of heart attack. If my blood pressure is up, we'll get down, get down my risk of heart attack. And what we're finding is this is not true. Here cortisol levels are a stronger predictor of heart attack risk than high cholesterol levels or high blood pressure. Cortisol is created by the adrenal glands when there is a stressful event. Uh, But modern life uh, can cause the adrenals to produce cortisol nonstop, leading to chronic diseases including diabetes, osteoporosis, and heart disease. The practices we have been mentioning all along this month, meditation, qigong, tai chi, and yoga, lower cholesterol. I'm sorry, lower cortisol, as do herbs, including astragalus, ginseng, and eleuthero, which is sometimes called Siberian ginseng. So, Even if we're in stressful situations, we can still find ways, foods, and herbs that can help us moderate that cortisol level because the cortisol level itself is one of the biggest factors in heart disease. The mechanisms by which stress hormones harm the heart are Not yet clear. We know that stress hormones narrow the arteries, and that restricts the flow of oxygen and nutrients to the heart. And we know that they can bind directly to the cells of the heart and interfere with the orderly flow of calcium into the cells. Uh, But we don't really know if 
we're seeing what's causative or we're just seeing associated things. So we're going to have to keep looking longer. Right now, the mechanism is definite. We know without a shadow of a doubt that stress hormones are going to lead to heart attacks. But we're not exactly sure how that happens. There is a rather odd thing called stress cardiomyopathy. And in stress cardiomyopathy, so many stress hormones are produced that the heart cells are stunned and symptoms of a heart attack occur. And I think we'll have time to actually go a little more deeply into um, cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's also, also called the broken heart syndrome. And if you're a postmenopausal woman and you think you're having a heart attack, it could be a short-term response to elevated levels of stress hormones. When the stress hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol flood the body, broken heart syndrome can be the result. Emotional stressors such as the death of a loved one, extreme anger, terror, or even a major surprise as well as physical stressors such as hemorrhage, seizure, or an asthma attack can cause stress hormones to build up so quickly in the blood that rapid but reversible degradation of the heart muscle occurs. The symptoms of stress cardiomyopathy mimic a heart attack. Blood pressure may fall precipitously and life-threatening heart rhythm abnormalities may occur. Typically, symptoms begin within minutes to a few hours after the stress occurs. With good care, there is full recovery without long-term damage to the heart. And we can put that in our bag with, oh my goodness, panic attack. This is not exactly a panic attack. It is, perhaps we might say, in the mid-ground there. The panic attack does not involve the heart, although certainly there are stress hormones. The heart attack completely involves the heart. And the stress cardiomyopathy seems like a heart attack, but is not doing the damage to the heart that an actual heart attack would do. Phytosterols are hormone-like substances found in plants. They are sometimes called plant cholesterol, but I think that that gives you the wrong idea because many of us think of cholesterol as a bad thing and something that we don't want and we want to eat a cholesterol low diet. So why would we want to consume plants that contain substances that are sometimes called plant cholesterol? Uh, well, it's because that comparison is more to the fact that these substances are used by plants in the same way that our bodies would use cholesterol. And that is as a starting material for a great many other substances. There are, in fact, over 200 different phytosterols currently known. Virtually every part of every plant contains some phytosterols, but they are most concentrated in seaweeds like kelp, roots like carrot seeds, like whole grains, oils pressed from seeds and fruits like olive oil, buds like artichokes, and berries like blueberries. It has been scientifically proven that phytosterols in the diet lower cholesterol. Phytosterols are chemically similar to cholesterol. That's back to the plant cholesterol there. So they're similar, chemically very similar. So they actually compete against cholesterol for absorption in the digestive tract. So in the digestive tract, there are cells that are trying to absorb cholesterol. And the phytosterols compete against the cholesterol and try to get absorbed by the digestive tract instead. So the cells that process cholesterol have to deal with both LDL and HDL cholesterol. When the ratio of LDL is too high, it interferes with our ability to use HDL, which is then just excreted. Phytosterols are more attractive to the cells that process cholesterol, and so 
they get used first, causing less LDL to be metabolized and freeing more HDL to be used in maintaining heart health. So less LDL is metabolized. That means it's excreted from the body, leaving behind the HDL to work its magic in maintaining heart health. Cytosterols actively prevent the absorption of dietary cholesterol, but they are non-soluble themselves and thus not easily absorbed. So cholesterol levels are reduced in two ways. Eating a diet rich in phytosterols reduces risk of heart disease, stroke, and heart attack. Now, you can buy foods such as orange juice and margarine, which are fortified with phytosterols. You go to your supermarket and you look around there in the, the case where, where you should be looking for butter. You're going to find some margarines that are actually fortified with phytosterols, and they're allowed then to say that this is for your heart. I prefer, however, to get my phytosterols from the foods and the herbs that they are found in. Our ability to utilize these phytosterols is dependent on several factors. First of all, we need healthy gut flora. That's absolutely critical to the process. When these substances come into our body, they are not preformed hormones. They are hormonal precursors and a precursor means that it is something from which another substance can be made or it is something that is there before the other substance can be made so healthy gut flora is what allows us to change these precursors into actual active hormones the plant hormones are not biologically active in the human body because we use human hormones. However, our gut flora can change those phytosterols into metabolically, biologically useful hormones and substances for our own bodies certainly means we need to pay more attention to healthy gut flora. In addition, utilization of phytosterols is increased when a plant contains many types of phytosterols plus glycosides, saponins, and or minerals. So we have good healthy gut flora, which is going to chew down on these phytosterols and convert them into active hormones. And we also have the increase in usability when we get them from plants because those plants contain not just one but many types of phyt phytosterols plus other plant constituents, including glycosides, saponins, and minerals that are necessary in order for our body to use the phytosterols. The amount of phytosterol and the composition, remember there's 200 different kinds in plants, varies greatly from phytosterolic foods to phytosterolic medicinal herbs. We're going to look at some phytosterolic foods, some phytosterolic food-like herbs, and some phytosterolic herbs. But because our time is limited, I will not go into the preparation and dosage of each of these herbs. They are, however, in my book, New Menopausal Years, The Wise Woman Way. Pages 69 to 77 gives you a much more thorough rundown of the herbs and foods that we're about to discuss. And um, we'll actually give you dosages as well as how to buy or prepare these foods and herbs. 
Phytosterolic foods. We remember that phytosterols are found in virtually all foods. So let's see where we're going to find the most phytosterols. Whole grains, all beans, all nuts, all edible seeds, and that includes flaxseed, leafy greens, fruits and berries, oils, olives, roots, chocolate, and pomegranate juice. Again, is this a prescription for, oh, woe is me, terrible things I have to do to keep my heart healthy? No. We're suggesting that a daily diet that includes whole grains, beans, nuts, edible seeds, leafy greens, fruits and berries, oils, olives, roots, chocolate, and pomegranate juice is going to benefit your heart big time. Phytosterolic food like herbs include astragalus, garlic, dandelion, fenugreek seeds, green tea, hops, nettle infusion, red clover infusion, red wine, and kelp seaweeds. The phytosterolic foods that we were just talking about, obviously we want to have it something containing those at every single meal. These phytosterolic food-like herbs can be consumed on a daily basis if you want to, or they can be used less frequently by preparing them in stronger ways. So if we want to use nettle infusion, we could consume a cup or two of nettle infusion on a daily basis, or we could use that in a regular and rotating way. We can use dandelion greens as one of our leafy greens, or we can make a tincture of dandelion and take that dandelion tincture. Again, looking at the phytosterolic food like herbs, which could be included into the diet on a near daily basis, or could be made more medicinal and used generally um, not so frequently. Cytosterolic herbs include agave juice, alfalfa tea, black cohosh root tincture, black haw root tincture, chaste berry tincture, cramp bark tincture, dong quai root tincture, devil's club root tincture, ginseng motherwort, peony root tincture, raspberry leaf infusion, rose leaf bud tincture, sage tea, sarsaparilla root infusion, saw palmetto berry tincture, wild yam root infusion, or tincture, and yarrow tincture. These phytosterolic herbs are used with care, but in moderate quantities for months or even years. Of these, there are three that I want to focus in on. Here in our ACE class, astragalus, red clover, and nuts. And this is not, uh, these are not new topics to us. You have heard me talk about red clover. You've heard me talk about astragalus. And uh, let's look most deeply into nuts then. Astragalus is a Chinese herb that has become a favorite with American herbalists. I think of it kind of as the Chinese equivalent of slippery elm, although it's not as soothing. Astragalus tincture or infusion protects and nourishes the spleen, the adrenal cortex, and the pituitary gland, thus diminishing the cumulative effects of stress in our life. The anti-inflammatory actions of astragalus counter swelling, lymphedema, and high blood pressure. I throw astragalus root slices, dried root slices, into soups and stews and add the dried powdered root to hummus, refried beans, yogurt, and such. This helps me to counter stress to improve my adaptability and to nourish my immunity. Astragalus has been shown to restore T cell function, increase interferon synthesis, and strengthen natural killer cells. Regular use of astragalus builds rich blood and invigorates body and soul. Astragalus tincture or infusion also has a 
powerful anti-inflammatory action. So it's not just linden and leafy greens that are anti-inflammatory. Astragalus, with its wonderful ability uh, to uh, change our hormones because it is rich in phytosterols, is definitely an herb to watch. Red clover, usually grown for pregnant and lactating cows throughout the westernized countries, and it's the flowering top. A tremendous way to keep the heart healthy and to reduce the effects of stress and to keep the blood free of clots. Compared to soy beverage, red clover infusion contains more calcium, fewer calories, no added sugar, and 10 times more phytosterols. Red clover contains all four major isoflavones, so I have just two of them, plus many hormone-like flavonoids, including isoflavone, deadzine, genistein, formononentin, biochanin, cystosterol, and cumesterol. In addition, it contains lignans and proteins. So you can see how a red clover could really change what's going on hormonally in our bodies. Red clover infusion taken regularly builds overall health, eases anxiety, promotes flexible blood vessels, and aids the lungs as well. Nuts. No, I'm not putting you down. Nuts. Nuts. The total antioxidant power of a serving of nuts is comparable to a serving of broccoli or tomatoes. Who would have thought that, oh, I need something that is an antioxidant. I'll have a fruit or a vegetable. How about a nut? Right? Nuts have nourished people since the early Stone Age when prehistoric nomads mixed ground almonds and pistachios with chopped dates, breadcrumbs, and sesame oil as a hearty travel food. Walnuts are actually thought to be the very first nuts eaten, and almonds, one of the first domesticated trees. All nuts are especially rich in nutrients critical for cardiovascular health, vitamin E, magnesium, and omega-3 fatty acids. Eating nuts on a regular basis has been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack and blood vessel disease. Nuts are very rich in monounsaturated fats. And next month, we're going to be talking about different kinds of fats. Monounsaturated fats are heart-healthy fats that actually decrease LDL cholesterol. And nuts also contain phytosterols, which are strongly associated with lower cholesterol levels. Eating foods rich in phytosterols, including nuts, soy, legumes, flax, and grains, will lower LDL cholesterol by 13 to 14 percent, and you don't even have to use a statin. Five large human epidemiological studies, including the Nurses' Health Study, the Iowa Health Study, the Adventist Health Study, and the Physicians' Health Study, all found that nut consumption is powerfully linked to a lower risk for heart disease. In fact, substituting nuts for an equivalent amount of carbohydrate in an average diet results in a 30% reduction in heart disease. If nuts are substituted for meat and dairy products, then the reduction in heart disease risk is an impressive 45%. In a group of over 600 men and women with high or normal total cholesterol, none of whom were taking cholesterol-lowering drugs. Those who ate two and a half ounces of nuts daily decreased their total cholesterol by 5%, their LDL cholesterol by 7.5%, and improved the LDL to HDL ratio by 8%. Triglyceride levels, meanwhile, fell more than 10%. And these benefits were most notable in those with initially high levels of LDL and those who had more saturated fat in their diet. Nuts lower blood pressure. They're an excellent source of the protein arginine, and arginine is a precursor to nitric acid, which expands blood vessels just like nitroglycerin does. 
Diets enriched with walnut showed a 64% improvement in dilation of blood vessels. The Omni Heart Study, which included four ounces of peanuts, or peanut butter a week, was more effective at lowering blood pressure than a healthy diet without nuts. Nuts reduce the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. And nuts help in weight loss, and obesity is a risk factor for heart disease. Nuts help prevent diabetes, and diabetes is a risk factor for heart disease. And we are going to be going there next month. We are going to be looking at how fats affect the heart. We are going to be looking at how diabetes affects the heart. And we are going to wrap up with some herbs that I think you should avoid. This is Susan Weed, and I invite you to come visit me at SusanWeed.com. I keep the U in Susan, but we own Susan Weed and Susan Weed, so spell it or misspell it, you'll still get over to my wonderful website with more than 8,000 pages of free information there for you. Or come visit the Wise Woman Bookshop, where you'll find my four books, Healing Wise, The Big Green Herbal for Everyone, my new book, Down There, Sexual and Reproductive Health, The Wise Woman Way, as well as my classics, Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year, New Menopausal Years, The Wise Woman Way, and Breast Cancer, Question Mark, Breast Health, Exclamation Point, The Wise woman way and that does it for this show and this month thank you so much gemini and time monk radio hey susan you have to give them an assignment eat more nuts okay got it three blessings everyone thank you susan this concludes part eight of our 12-part series a healthy heart the wise woman way with susan weed at time monk radio